Good afternoon, my name is Stephen Haig at MTS Systems Corporation and today we're going to be doing excerpts from the MTS Test Rig Design class. Today's focus is going to be on sources of uncertainty and error in testing and test rigs. Who am I? I'm Stephen Haig, Senior Design Engineer at MTS. I've been working here for most of my career, worked on a lot of different machines and test setups over the years and talked to customers about their requirements pretty much uh, most of my life. So. The test development cycle is actually a lot of in distinctive steps. The development de definition, design, fabrication, and integration. We're not going to talk about all of those steps, certainly, especially not today. Uh, we are going to focus on defining our test requirement. What do we want to learn from this test and how are we going to learn it is our most important detail. Today, we're going to talk about sources of error that come out of the test rigs. Um, Test rigs are dependent upon transducers for data and information. They measure what is happening and they measure the environment around them. Um, defining things like road data, for example, or flight data, and then we measure that. Well, what do we measure? We measure milliamps and microvolts and ones and zeros and nanoseconds and milliohms and coulombs and things like that. We don't actually measure and report the item we want. What if we want force? Is this the right force? How right is it? Maybe it's right, how right? How fine are you going to look at it to find the errors? Stephen Hawking, one of my favorite guys, says the greatest enemy of knowledge is not ignorance, it is the illusion of knowledge. And we see a lot in things. Ignorance is bliss. Thomas Gray, clear back in 1678. It's a great poem, by the way. And of course, when we were trying to figure out how road simulators worked, there was a group of us in Detroit that used to meet regularly called the American Society for Better Simulation. And we said, you don't know what you don't know until you know it, because a lot of times we found that out the hard way. So what we'd like to do is ideally not find out the hard way. We would like to be able to calibrate things so we know the accuracy that they're reporting. We know what the scatter is. We know what its characteristic is. Sometimes we can't trace things to a, a repeatable calibration or a standard like gravity or um, some kind of in the international standard for length or mass. Instead, maybe we just want to set, check the system and make sure it's doing the same thing before and after a test. And then we can realize that it's likely that the data reported was correct during the test. We call those in situ calibration checks. You're not really calibrating the machine directly, you're just checking to see if it's performing consistently. Source of error in calibration. There's basically three major sources of error that we get in calibrations. One is in training, making sure that everybody knows exactly what they're doing and how to do it properly. And we can have errors in the transducers themselves. Measurement errors, we can have like eccentricity or poor fixturing or friction, other things like that can make errors in our data. And machine dynamics definitely cause errors in reported data. Some errors can be compensated. Things that are linear or consistent and repeatable can be measured and can be compensated. But they have to be measured. Things that are not compensatable, hysteresis, nonlinearity, lash, a high gain resonance, those things are going to cause problems in the data in ways that we cannot really correct. In many cases, we may not even detect them. Only items that can be measured can be used for compensation. For example, if I need to know the side load on a transducer in order to get the right output, I would have to measure that load. I can't figure it out later after the data is already recorded. So you have to plan ahead. MTS does a lot of multi-axial load transducers. A very complex environment that we work in here and you can't just buy this stuff off the shelf. We're very careful with our multi-axial calibration and one of the only companies in the world that steps the multi-axial transducer through all simultaneous combinations of load in the process of calibrating it so we get a very comprehensive crosstalk matrix with, this, with the amplitudes and phases of all the channels across the frequency range. We can then use that in a transducer conditioning box to calibrate the data and convert it so the output is as linear and decoupled as possible. In situ type calibration checks are demonstrated here. Maybe a moment of inertia check where we're swinging known amount of weights in space and known distance. We know it should have a certain amount of inertia. Or maybe push against a spring or a uh, damping and stiffness standard for an elastomer machine such as we see over on the right. So those things have very repeatable stiffness and damping characteristics so they can be inserted into the machine and used to check not only the machine and its transducers but also the software and the connection paths and the analysis 
capability. General transducers are considered to have a certain accuracy. We look here at a load cell at a half percent, an LVDT is one percent, load washers, accelerometers all have a so-called rated accuracy. Well, let's take a look at that rated accuracy a little bit. We look at an LVDT here, it's one percent accurate. Well, that, that must mean that the piston rod is correct to one percent, right? I mean, if the transducer is right to 1%, the piston rod should be to 1%. So let's take a look at that. The LVDT body down here is where the displacement is being measured. So what, effect, what different things can affect the displacement of the piston rod relative to that point? Well, first of all, the piston rod is going to be surrounded by hot oil when it comes out of the laboratory temperature at about 15, 16 degrees C, say, and then we heat it up to uh, 100 degrees C, we're going to raise the temperature about 50 degrees C there. That's a big change. That piston rod is going to get longer. Well, that's not going to be shown in the LVDT. The thermal effect on the LVDT housing, as the housing warms up, it's going to get longer. The measurement point is going to move up relative to the base. Thermal effect on the LVDT core extension. The LVDT is attached to the piston with a rod attachment and then we've got a core extension as we've shown down here. That has a thermal effect. When it gets warm it gets longer and so the end of the piston rod is going to move up. Load effect on piston rod length. If we push on that piston rod or pull on the piston rod it's going to get longer or shorter. So that's going to change the position relative to where the LVDT is measuring it. Load effect on the base. If we push with the actuator, we're going to compress the base. So that means that the piston rod is going to move down relative to where we think it is. Load effect on base deflection. This is mounted to a base plate or a bracket of some kind. That's likely to move as well under changing load. So all of those things mean that the variation in the output of the actuator can be a little different than exactly what we're measuring. There's other things as well. This is times I measure variation in excitation voltage is another potential source of change or error. So these variables could be measured and compensated, but I don't know of anyone who has ever done that. Rather, if they need a really critical measurement, maybe they go to a remote transducer or an extensometer or some other way to do the measurement. Otherwise, most people just ignore errors like this. But in fact, we don't know exactly where the end of the piston rod is based on the LVDT data because we're not measuring at the point we honestly want to know. And that's just the way it works in many cases. Let's take a look at our load transducers. Load transducer accuracy, 0.5%. Well, here's the transducer specification drawing and in the fine print, and you always, you know, you got to read the fine print. We take it, we blow that up a little so you can read it. Here we've got all of these potential sources of error. Static error band, nonlinearity, output symmetry, hysteresis, non-repeatability, etc., etc., etc. And down to zero balance plus or minus one percent. Some of these things we can compensate in the electronics. Some of these things are uncompensated and uncompensatable. And so what does that lead to? That leads to a certain level of uncertainty in the load cell output. And so it's an intelligent thing for us to do is to, is to figure out how much is that uncertainty and keep in mind that that's a potential error in our output and our potentially our, our conclusions. Um, <clears throat> what are the sources of uncertainty? Well, the measuring instrument. Changes due to long-term drift, wear, age, abuse, poor readability, electrical noise all contribute. I like my pressure gauge over there. Did you take a look at what pressure it's reading? Hmm, it's reading a was pressure, it looks like to me. The item being measured. Try to measure the size of a melting ice cube, for example. That's a bit of a challenge. Measurement process. Is it difficult to align or tricky to implement? Do I need special skills or training? Is it modification? of item for the transducer. Sometimes we have to glue things on or we have to stick things in or we have to reach into something. Is that going to change the dynamics? If we have to insert, insert a transducer into our specimen or our load train, are we going to change the way it responds? Imported uncertainties, quality of calibration, frequency related errors and things like that or other sources of error often are not mapped. Operator skill improper operation or improper readings. Parallax is a good one. You look at the scale on the right over there and it's easy to see that depending on where you put your head you're going to get a different answer. Sampling issues. Does this item measure exactly the same as all the others? Can you get the measurement at exactly the location where it is needed? The example we had with the LVDT and the piston rod was one of those where I can't measure right where I want to. There will be errors then. What sampling rate is required to catch the range of interest? You have to know something about digital data and 
conditioning it, working with Nyquist and things before you can make intelligence decisions about your sample rates and requirements. Measurements made remote from the ideal location must be transformed or corrected to move the data to the point we want to measure it. For example, on the right hand side we see some load transducers, strain gauge load transducers in this case. Well, we look at the, where the load is applied, it's not applied right where the gauge is located. The gauge is located in the load path, so the load will travel through it, but it will be modified by the material of the load cell in the process. There's mass there, there's uh, stiffness there. So what happens? We get magnitude effects, we get frequency effects, and we get phase effects, all coming into having the measurement point remote from the spot where we're doing the measuring. How much uncertainty does this correction introduce? So when we move the data back to the face of the load cell, what are the sources of error for that? Mass, inertial loading, deformation. Combining several transducer signals increases the total uncertainty. Let's say we want to sum three or four load transducers together to get a reading. How accurately are they located? Do we know exactly where they are? To what level of accuracy? What, are there any forces trapped between four cells? For example, if they're bolted to a single plate and that plate changes temperature. How much force is trapped into the cells? We have no idea. We can't measure that. We can, but it is normally not measured and it's difficult to measure. Forces, uh, accuracy as loading position changes. If we load right on the center of the load cell, we'll get one reading. What if we load two inches off the center? What about 10 inches off the center? What about the individual transducer accuracy? If we've got four transducers summed, we're going to multiply the errors of any one transducer combining those signals. We'll talk about a specific case of compensation. In this case, inertial compensation. Very common since we have things that are moving dynamically. We have masses and things coupled to them. In the case here, we want to measure the tire patch load. When it contacts the wheel pan, we want to know the load right there. Well, obviously we can't measure load right at the tire patch. The tire's in the way. So what do we have to do? We measure the forces reacted through the wheel pan. Here's a couple of examples with a single load cell and then a load cell array. What are the differences? Well, the wheel pan inertial force is included in the measurement. F equals MA. Tire patch moves around on the wheel pan and the tire creates shear loads on the wheel pan when it's moving. So we've got horizontal loads, we've got a moving position, we've got vertical dynamics. A single load cell, the shear and moment loading changes the output because we're eccentrically loading the cell, bending it and shearing it. And it fatigue damages the load cell. The tire can sit on one side and pound for a while and we can repeatedly bend the load cell and cause fatigue damage. A load cell array, on the other hand, can share the shear loading from the tire between three cells, but it can have unknown loads trapped in between the three cells. What happens if the tire is bouncing around and the tire pan heats up, for example? The moment loading is reduced by using three cells. They share the load. But by summing three signals into a signal output, we're reducing the overall accuracy of the transducer. Inertial compensation, what's a real statement of the problem here? Well, what we've got is we've got moving masses and we've got a remote, remote load measurement. So with our load transducer down here, we've got mass of specimen and fixtures and somewhere up here is where we really want the load. So as we move, we not only compress the spring that's our specimen, but we also accelerate and therefore the mass that's here sees an acceleration force. Now the way uh, Newton taught us calculus, displacement and acceleration are essentially 180 degrees out of phase. So really what the load cell does is subtracts the inertial load from the spring load and reports lower force out of the load cell than the specimen actually sees. So what we really want to do is compensate for that. We want the right force up here at the top. Well, if we add an accelerometer here, we measure the acceleration and we condition it, multiply it times the effective moving mass, we're effectively subtracting the acceleration or inertial component from the overall load cell signal and the corrected signal should be more accurate. And that does work. There are limits, however. For one thing, you've got to have a single contiguous mass with no resonances anywhere near the, re the frequency range of operation. You've got to pretty have a pretty well-behaved system and good clean waveforms. You have to be careful about phase shift or filtering, especially when you get into summing these transducers. For example, if you're trying to sum an accelerometer and a load cell, they likely have a different natural frequency. That means as you start to run at higher frequencies, you're going to phase shift and amplitude shift the signals between those two. 
Then if you try and do an algebraic sum, you're going to subtract the MA from the existing MA. You're going to have errors due to very, even small phase lags give you very large errors in the algebraic summing. So we have to be very careful of what cases this actually gives us the accuracy that we want. Here's an example of investigating the uncertainty of an inertially compensated system. This was just a, a few simple tests that were run to demonstrate this. Um, we had a, several different masses of, with a constant acceleration of 5 g's and we looked at the uncertainty error of the correction. Variables include frequency, displacement, velocity, acceleration, and the mass. Those variables all add up to a fairly high level of uncertainty, as much as 25 percent in this example. Those numbers can be all over the map. Well, and then the errors are going to be increased by tire scrubbing forces, temperature changes, and eccentric loading as the tire moves around in the wheel pan. Do we really know the accuracy of the end data when it comes out? I don't think so. What are other sources of uncertainty in our environment? Well, temperature, of course, I mentioned that several times. It's probably the single biggest change factor for transducers and accuracy of measurements. Steady state is easy to compensate. We can soak things in ovens at steady state temperatures and we can apply resistors or compensation techniques to take and linearize or flatten that curve so it's not very sensitive to temperature. But if we have say heat on one side of a transducer and cold on the other side, now we've got a real problem. We can't compensate for heat flow or differential temperature across the transducer and so that is going to change our data. In such cases where we have transducers in environments that may involve temperature, we often put uh, water cooling plates on each end of the transducer so we try and maintain the same temperature at both ends rather than specifically heating or cooling the transducer to a certain temperature. Humidity and moisture can be sources of noise, of, co of course, especially uh, salt and corrosion issues with electronics. Vibration can be a problem. Things can break loose. Wires can come free. Gauges can break free. Magnetic fields are an interesting challenge for transducers, especially transducers that are moving, such as the wheel force transducer we see here in the movie. It's basically moving through uh, the magnetic field of the Earth. So if we had any loops or coils or rings on there, those would immediately pick up noise from that moving through that and would generate voltage we'd think would be a signal. So obviously a lot of extra design work is done to compensate for that. Today, with, especially with computers used in our conditioning equipment, modern digital controllers can compensate for these uh, nonlinearities, shall we say, in many different ways. Is the compensated output truly calibrated? I mean, how does that work? I don't, I'm not sure our standards quite address all of those issues today with the, with the capabilities to do all this compensation. Is the accuracy of the transducer really increased? Well, the accuracy of, accuracy of the transducer is the same. We're modifying how we read the data and use it to our biggest advantage. Mechanical resonance. Whenever you hear Steve Haig talk about stuff, you're almost bound to hear him talk about ringing and mechanical resonance. And here we go again. Of course, we know about mechanical resonance, but I'm going to remind you again, at the resonant frequency, you've got both a phase lag and an amplitude change. And you see both of those effects down as low as 10 percent of the actual natural frequency. So these need to be important, especially when we're talking about a multi-axial world. The gain of system dynamic response increases at resonant frequency and decreases, decreases above. As we see here, our output actually becomes less than our input as we get above natural frequency. 180 degree phase shift occurs between the input and the output as we cross through the natural frequency. That's the thing to look for when you're looking for a resonance. Not for the highest magnitude frequency, but for the 90 degree phase point. Rate of change of gain and phase are dependent on system overall damping. Lightly damped systems don't have as much phase change, but tend to have much more amplitude change. So things are a trade-off. Sources of resonance, the loading system, the specimen, the reaction system, the transducers can all be sources of resonance issues and phase shift. Significant issues for dynamic measurement really comes into play when we ch sweep across different frequency ranges. If we've got, maybe we've got downstream resonances, which is what I call within the measured structure itself. After the transducer's installed, we might change the resonant response. There might be transducer characteristics itself. Say if you've got a wheel force transducer or any kind of multi-axial transducer, do you know that the phase and amplitude between all six axes changes together and at the same amount and at the same time, that doesn't seem likely. 
We use inertial acceleration compensation. We often have off-axis loading, transducer mounting effects, bolt-up and end effects, cross-coupling and cross-talk, deflection during dynamic loading, combining different transducers for a single measurement. All of that adds to our overall level of uncertainty. It's very important if you want to read high frequency data to have very high stiffness, high natural frequency transducers. This is an example here where we've got 100 hertz content in this load pulse. It's like about 4,000 newtons, a little over 4,000 newtons there. With a transducer with a frequency of less than 400 hertz, we see here that we're about a hundred, about a th one kilonewton error, about a 25% error on that signal. If we increase the natural frequency of the transducer, now we're going to see that the accuracy is increased. We're only getting about a 5% error, substantially better overall accuracy. Transducer and system dynamics attenuate the output. You know, if you've got a six degree of freedom transducer here, and you've got different phase and amplitude characteristics at each channel that's going to color the various way, channels in ways you don't really know. Here's an example measuring a ball doing against a swift transducer where the data look pretty good. Well here we're measuring against another transducer. That transducer did not work out very well above about 20 hertz. So this is an example of the problems we can run into when we start to expand the frequency range for our transducers. Modifying the structure to measure the forces is very common. In this case, you see we've inserted a load transducer into the uh, control arm. It change, might change the stiffness and natural frequency. Could change the natural other stiffness and natural frequencies in other axes, such as cross axes or other directions. It might change the natural frequency of the modified component. Now it's got a new natural frequency and might color the data in a different way. It might change the system damping characteristics. You know, here's an example of we've got a load transducer into a dynamic system. In this case, we've got our simple spring bouncy model. So when we get to the 15 hertz that's the natural frequency in this sample, the amplitude response of the bouncy goes way up higher. You see here. So, but the load cell down here at the bottom, what does it see? It sees the inverse of that. It says at 15 hertz, I hardly have to provide any force to get lots of output. In other words, the load cell sensitivity is dropping as we get near the resonant frequency. Its sensitivity becomes very low, in fact, to the point where it could give us problems with control. What can we do about that, especially if we don't even know those resonances exist? Well, we can use other transducers to feed that information. For example, if we have an accelerometer on a resonant body and we start to see a lot of deflection, the accelerometer is going to light up at that frequency. It's going to give us a lot of output, very high gain sensitivity. So if we can combine that with the low gain sensitivity of the load transducer, we're going to end up with a signal that's going to be much more accurate overall to give us the information we need. And oh, by the way, RPC Pro can do those things for you. Here's examples of load frames for different frequency ranges. You can see that at a glance that they're very different in design, different stiffnesses, different coupled masses. Um, of course, we even change the different types of transducers for higher frequency testing. For example, to go to 1000 hertz, we use accelerometers rather than LVDTs, and we use load, piezoelectric load washers rather than strain gauge load cells to get the frequency range accuracy up much better. What about off-axis loading, nice little picture there, side loading or moment loading a load cell. Is that going to give you the same output as loading straight on? Well, you don't know, and you don't know what the error would be. You look at the right over here, you see our gain curves. Ideally, we've got a readout that's very proportional to our force. Everything's linear and we like it. But then if we put an external load on this, such as an eccentric force here, we could shift the DC offset, we could shift the gain change, or some combination of them such that that same force input now gives us a different output. It can also shorten the life of the transducer. This is an example of a constraint discussion. What effect does over constraint have on loads, loading the readouts and accuracy of the system? In this case, the test is a lower control arm and subframe attachment bracket. You see the specimen is mounted in here. We want to load it longitudinally and laterally. This normally holds the bottom of a steering knuckle. So when you drive down the road, your tire provides forces there. Very common test. It's a very common product. So a little description, a kinematic description of the system. 
The longitudinal channel's got a swivel base here on the actuator, and then there's a ball joint here, and then we've got a rigid load arm over here, and then we've got another swivel over here to the lateral actuator, which is rigidly mounted. You see here a bracket to the end cap. So, <clears throat> what happens when we move longitudinally? Well, because we don't have a degree of freedom here, we have to bend this silvery link. You see in the red here, it bends to an S-type shape. When we do that, we put a moment and shear load into the actuator and load transducer, which is, of course, bad for most of everything. So what's our problem there? Well, the problem is we don't have enough degrees of freedom. We don't have a swivel here for this short little link to move on. It's got to bend to follow the load. So why don't we put a swivel in there? Here's a very similar test that's got swivels at both ends of that strut. So we added a swivel in here. So now what happens when we displace our specimen with a longitudinal force? This is our tension compression load that we're bringing into our specimen laterally. We displace longitudinally and now we've got that lateral force is at a slight angle. So that angle brings in different co vector components of the force. We've got a shear force as well as our tension compression load. That shear force, of course, provides a load to the load cell and the actuator, but it's a relatively small load compared to the force we had to bend that length the same distance. And, of course, we've got a little bit of an error here, too. Our compression load now gives us a little thrust load. That thrust load is read by this load transducer. So if we knew the displacement and this force, we could compensate for that load, but that's rarely done. So what's another option we could do to fix that problem? Well, in this case, we added a strut in here to the bell crank. Now as the strut moves around, the bell crank accepts all those off-axis loads, and the actuator just does tension compression between swivels and the load cells right here and doesn't see all that side loading problem. Here's an example of an improperly mounted actuator. They told me, well, there wasn't enough space back here to fit the swivel, so we put it on top, but we have a heck of a problem burning out these end caps. Well, yeah, I think so. Every time you push on this, you're trying to rotate this around. There's a huge bending moment here on the actuator and on the load transducer both. Bad plan. Here's another case. In this case, we're over-constrained. We've got a clamped actuator here, no degrees of freedom, so it can go straight in the line that these two end caps prescribe. And then we've got linear roller bearings over here. They have their own path of motion. If these two paths of motion are not identical, they're going to sideload that actuator. One bearing in a system very rarely is adequate. This is kind of an interesting one. The problem here is we have a short connecting strut to a multi-axial loading situation. That short connecting strut puts a high angle here on this load cell and with a spacer on the end of the load cell besides, that really increases the prying moment. And you can see here, physically, you can see what it's doing to the load transducer. Large moment on load cell, large side load on piston rod, large bending stresses on piston rod. I predict this actuator has a short life. Spacer between the strut and the load cell multiplies the moment loading problem. So the load cell output has large errors and short life. This is a big moment arm that's going to get a fairly high angle with that short strut. Well, what are some problems, some ways we can address that problem? This is our short strut example here in the bending load. That's a big problem. So we can make a little longer strut, shorten that spacer out of here and lengthen the strut. That helps a little. We could swivel mount the actuator at both ends and make it the loading strut connected directly through. We could isolate it with a bell crank, such as in our other example. We put the load cell in another strut, like this. Then it's not loaded by the load cell, or it moves with the strut. It doesn't cause any side loading of the load cell or the actuator. So this is the first one. Making this strut is a little longer is OK. Removing the side loading situation altogether by putting a pair of swivels or by putting a strut in here, those are better yet. And the best of all, of course, is to put it in the strut and then isolate the whole works from the actuator. Of course, in Minnesota, you know, we talk a little different than a lot of you other guys do. Here in Minnesota, we don't say it's good. We say it's not bad or not too bad or not too bad at all, don't you know? So if you come to Minnesota, you can come enjoy our beautiful state. You can come and shovel some snow and you can learn to talk Minnesota. So swivel friction is another source of error in load measurements. We've got, if we've got 
swivels in our load train, we will have friction in our load cell readings. You see some examples here. This was a multi-axial airbag test, so we preload it and then we swivel it around. And you can see here with different preloads, we get increased hysteresis in the bearings and quite a significant level of friction you can see from these bearings. Well, every bearing has to move when we move, so every load cell is going to pick up the friction from all of the swivels inboard of the load cells. That's a very common source of error. The other thing we can run into is stick-slip behavior between the sliding swivels can excite system resonances and add a lot of noise on the system. Where's the best place for load transducers in terms of overall accuracy? Right at the point of in input of the load or at the reaction point for the force. Very dynamic tests, we, ideally we like it at the reaction side, such as you see here with this elastomer where there's a lot of motion going on. If we had the load cell on the moving side, we'd have to compensate for the inertial errors, the acceleration and moving masses. If we put the load cell here, for example, to measure the forces into the train wheels, we need very little compensation. It's right where we need it. If we had transducers here on the actuators, the swivels would give a tremendous amount of error in the load outputs and we wouldn't be able to measure the suspension characteristics very accurately. There's other sources of error. There could be sources of error in the test concept or test setup. For example, here we've got an inertially reacted test. We expect that this engine block will move the way it does on the road because we're moving the, engine, the frame of the vehicle in the same way it did on the road. We apply torques and other things to that. We should be able to get the right thing. Well, how do we get the right overall engine motion, the right loads in each mount? Well, first of all, are they all at the same temperature? No, they're not. Not when they're in service. Do we replicating the right temperatures in the lab? What's the connection between the engine chassis must be included? Everything, wiring, plumbing, hoses. People don't think about what effect, for example, hoses to your radiator have when they're pressurized. They're really quite stiff. Parasitic loads considered, mass of the exhaust system, flex coupling, damping, and other things. Are these dynamic elements considered? Lack of internal rotating elements. The flywheel's not spinning, we're not changing engine speed. Those all affect the overall forces generated on the inertial body. Those are really sources of error and are often not well understood or b investigated. Cross coupling is another, error, another potential source of error. If I've got several actuators that share a specimen or fixturing, if one actuator moves, the other ones have to move, we have to figure out what we're going to do about that cross coupling. Are we going to compensate it in the controller? Are we going to model it? Are we going to measure it out? Are we going to iterate it out? Um, this is an example. We've got multiple actuators on a beam. If one actuator provides a load, all the other actuators have to move. How can we best compensate for that? Do we want to put a stiffness model of the beam into the control system? Well, that's been done, as a matter of fact. We do that fairly often, especially in the aerospace industry, to speed up how fast you can run to these very slow load control tests. But somewhere along the line, you should ask yourself the question, how much accuracy is required? The uh, gentleman that used to run the General Motors Worldwide Fatigue Test Program, he had an observation one time, says, if you give me a number with more precision than I need, you've wasted my time. Why is that? Well, if you've given me more precision than I need, you took a little more time and effort to provide me a more precise answer. Maybe I just didn't need that investment. So how much accuracy is required to answer the question, what do we want to learn from this test? Everything should stem from that, just like we talked about in the last session. So how predictable is the operating environment? How predictable is the specimen? When we're doing simulations in the laboratory, a lot of times people have a concept of so-called golden road, the ideal surface, the one signal we're going to replicate. Is there such a thing? No. Is life deterministic? If we have nominally identical specimens, we run them around the same environment, with supposedly the same loading history, do they all respond the same? No. No, they don't. Life is not deterministic. It follows the statistical distribution. Distribution in forces, distribution in material strength, and distribution in flaws, all the other stuff that come into real life. How much accuracy is required? Do all parts and service experience the same conditions? Well, some people are harder drivers. Some people hit the brakes harder. Some people hit potholes more often. Some people do other things differently. That means we're going to have scatter in how the product is actually used and how the failures manifest themselves. I'm a member of the SAE Fatigue Design and Evaluation Committee for a number of years now and for the last decade or so we've been working on what we call the Total Life Program. The Total Life Program has been studying wells and fatigue prediction of wells. 
been an interesting program. Every time we look at it, we just found out what more stuff we didn't know. But what we did find out for sure, in spite of all 10 years of investigation, is welds are highly variable. Even robot-made welds out of identical materials and, env and technical environments can vary in life, in this case, by 10 to 1. That's a lot of scatter. Well, if we add all these stati statistical distributions, say that five times at home, and uh, put those all together, we get a family of curves of the likelihood of failure. Well, you know, you guys in the test lab don't really have to worry about those things so much, but somebody somewhere in your company has to decide what's the right level of damage to represent my environment. We've got to have just enough accuracy to answer the question, but remember, we need enough repeatability to make valid engineering decisions as the design changes. It's a little bit of a dichotomy, I know. Welcome to testing. Well, here's a, a, one of the larger specimens that I personally have ever seen. Uh, it's a hydrogen, liquid hydrogen tank for a rocket. Uh, it has two f booster rockets bolted to the sides of it and the payload then on top, so it carries a tremendous level of stress, vibration, and force, millions of pounds, millions of kilonewtons of force. Um, so if we take a look at some of these dimensions, 50 meters long, 9 meters in diameter. They put 3,800 strain gauges on it. Are they all right? Well, we sure hope so. The loading frame itself is 25 stories high and 35 meters wide. It has over 3,500 tons of steel. This is a serious test. They invested something in this test. So the question you should ask them is, well, how much accuracy do I need? How much accuracy do I need to take people into space? They'll put a bracket on your accuracy number, and people spend a lot of time trying to figure that out. Well, we just did a brief overview of potential sources of error in testing. Hopefully these are errors you can define out and design out very early in the program and not have to live with at the tail end when they can't be measured or compensated anymore. Of course, this is just one step in a long journey to get an operating test done. Hopefully in the future we'll get a chance to talk about some of these other steps. In the meantime, you can always contact MTS for training and further information. Thank you very much.